Now, on this week's big interview, I'll be talking to one of Ireland's best-known singers. He's back with a brand new album called The Voice of Hope 2. So on tonight's big interview, I'll be meeting Tommy Fleming. sitting here so long for you to hear my song and all you want to know is am I on the radio who's the biggest star I've seen and what's my favorite scene and if I get the job would I sing on Yes, sir, I will sing on Mars. I play upon a star. I'd sing songs of the sun. And when my job was done, I would say I love you so. I'd like to sing one more. Just for all the young lovers, for the road. Tell me, son, yeah, just how far I need to go to be a star. I have known my highs and lows. I've worked on every show. I've played in every town and brought some houses down. But critics never notice me. I'm not a star, you see. And yet I give my heart to every heart. I would stand for hours and hours. I'd walk through some showers with my dancing shoes and my dreams and views I'd walk upon an empty stage with one light on my face to be told don't phone us but we'll phone you tell me so yeah just how far I need to to be a star, to be a star, every day the same old scene, the same old happiness, a hundred miles of shows, and yet no place to go, but when your look is all out, you're asked to take a just stolen the show but now you're on your own. yes sir I would sing on Mars my dream scene is me a star me a star me a star I am a star. So that's one of my all time favourite songs, Roll Back the Clouds, from Tommy Fleming, who joins me now in the studio. Tommy, how are you, sir? I'm very good. Great to see you again, Robin. Good to see you again. Yeah. So, Roll Back the Clouds, one of the songs from your new album, the, new album. the Voice of Hope 2. Yeah. 
I know it's a Christy Hennessy song, so I was oh. good friends with Christy, massive fan of the song. Why did you want it on the album? Do you know what? The first time I actually ever heard this song was played on, um, in Dublin on 2FM by a DJ called Gareth O'Callaghan. I think that was about 92 or 93. And I listened to it and I thought, wow, this is just gorgeous. Yeah. And the story in the song is, I think every singers, every actor, every entertainer, I mean, anybody that works in, in theatre, when you hear the words of the song, it's, it's about trudging the roads. It's about p paving that path, that path for your career. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a lot of doors get closed in your face, but a lot of doors get opened as well. And it's all part, I suppose rejection, in my view, would be as important as acceptance. In the, in the job that we're in. You know, we don't look at this through rose-tinted glasses. That's how I would see it. When I first sang it a few weeks ago, I thought, wow, that's my story. But then again, that's a lot of people that are in my job or what I do for a living. That's all their stories. Yeah. Did you get much rejection in the early days? Ah, yeah, of course I did. Yeah. And I mean, rightly so, because there was no, f there was no, f you know, there was no quick road to this. There was no, you have to, you know, I mean, I still don't see things as a success you know I mean yes there's of course there's success there but I'm never I'm, I'm not finished yet you know and the rejection has always been a learning curve for me and I knew not to make that mistake twice so I did it somewhat different the next yeah. time around and it's like a job interview you know what I mean you have you'll get some you'll lose some you know you make some um, and today when I look at I suppose the industry as it is and you see Programs like The X Factor, mm -hmm. programs like um, oh, Britain's Got Talent, yeah. any of those. And for some people, it's a, great, it's a great platform, but sometimes I think the people that are in it are very young yeah. and they're just not, it's not that they're not experienced enough in their job, they're just not experienced enough in life. Yes, yeah. And that it just, they need to be, they need a, bit, they need a few more years behind them. Did you always know that singing and entertaining was something you were going to be <laughs> destined to do. I never looked at it like that, Robin. I always did it. Mm. I mean, it was something that's always there. It's like, a, it's like an, an, another limb. Yeah. Um, and how I found it was, I suppose, I, I sang when I was very, very young and all my family sang and played instruments. But I remember I was about 14. I was 14 when I did my first gig and I knew then I could get paid for this. <laughs> um, and at that, that time you could go into a pub when you were 14 and work or whatever. Do you remember how much you got paid for your first gig? I remember my first gig getting paid, I got paid £25. <laughs> punts, yeah. And it was a fortune. Yeah. And I remember I spent £15 of that £25 on a pair of black Levi's <laughs> in Lion's Shop in Sligo. But anyway. And what were you singing back then? What did you sing uh, in It was your all pub covers. Gigs? Yeah. It was all some Irish songs, songs I still sing today actually. Yeah. But then there was songs that you would cover, like the Carpenters' Top of the World. <laughs> and, you know, you had to have the fast numbers yes, for yeah. so people could jive. And, yeah. um, so I did all of that. And then I suppose as the years progressed and I got older and got a little bit more wiser, I had hoped, I kind of started doing somewhat more original stuff and started working with songwriters. That if I didn't write the song or co-write it, then I worked with a songwriter that gave me the song. Yes, yeah. That was original-ish, you know. Um, so I kind of, that's one way I've st I was stamping it. But was I, did I feel, I, no, I never looked at it as like I was destined. It was always a, a means to an end. So, you know, when I was in college, that was a way of keeping going. When I was, no matter where I was, it, it was a job that gave me a great passport. Yes, yeah. You know, so if I went away for a summer when I was very young, I could work in pubs, you know, yeah. singing in pubs. And I got more, I got paid more than, I got paid twice as much standing on a small stage for two hours than I would have had for standing on my feet for five, for six or seven. Oh, wow, yeah. So then yeah. I knew, I yeah. knew the value of it, I suppose, yes, more yeah. than anything. So I suppose my, si I was in Leaving Search, which is the final year in school, and my sister was teaching me actually, and she was doing her H-dip, her higher diploma. Right. And I was making more at the weekend than she was making <laughs> as a teacher. So I think that's why if you're saying was I destined for it, not that I was destined for it, I just knew what side my bread was buffered on. <laughs> <laughs> so how did the first big break happen? It was with the Dannon, wasn't it? The first one was with Gabe Byrne, really, okay. uh, on the Late Late Show. And I was 21, I think it was 21, when I did my first Late Late Show appearance mm -hmm. on RT1. So that kind of opened a lot of doors. Then I met Phil, Phil Coulter, who I'm still a very good friends with Phil. And Phil invited me along. I was singing in pubs still at this point. 
So Phil brought me along on his Irish tour initially, which was in the Cork Opera House, University Concert Hall, um, National Concert Hall in Dublin, all those great venues. So I was thrown, I suppose, into the deep end because I came from a school of thought that was you were in the corner of a pub singing at the top of your voice trying to get over the, yeah. the chatter and the glasses clinking and everything else to an absolute, like nearly 2,000 people sitting yeah. still waiting to hear you. So I had to learn that very fast. Then, then I went on to America with Phil when I did, that was 22 at that point, and that's when I did my first appearance in Carnegie Hall. Wow. And that was the turner. That was when it, that's when I said, this is what I want. What was that feeling like the first time on Carnegie Honestly, Hall? Honestly, yeah. terrified. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> to the point of I got sick before I went on. Wow. Yeah. And I suppose I've learned to control the nerves a good bit more, but there's, I'm always, I wouldn't say I'm nervous with a show. I'm not, a lot, a lot of the time I'm apprehensive because mm -hmm. I never know how it'll, has it worked initially. And, you know, there's always tweaks and changes. But my first feeling, I was in Carnegie Hall, 3,000 people dressed in their finery, coming to see this young fella that felt like a fraud when I was doing it at the time. Yeah. Um, so it was, that's when I realised I can do this and went for it, I suppose. And, and you're there with Phil Coulter I was there well, with Phil so. in a full orchestra. Actually, second time I did it, I, um, I worked with Liam Neeson on it. Uh, wow. That was in 96. And that was a great experience. That was a fantastic experience. Um, and, and from there, it kind of just, it became... It became part of me, and it became, um, it became my job. Yeah, really. yeah. What about Liam Neeson? Would he be a good friend then? I have known. I've met Liam several times. I would know the family very well. When I was recording, actually, um, we were talking about Ballymena when we were off air. Um, and when I was recording the Restless Spirit album, which I recorded in 1998, um, I stayed with Kitty, um, oh, right, yes. Liam's mum. I stayed with Kitty in uh, Ballymena because I was recording it in Randallstown. Right. And there was no accommodation at the time in Randallstown. So I, uh, I used to stay with Kitty and go up and down every day. So she, she used to mammy me for, while I was up recording the <laughs> album, which was great. It was, it was wonderful. So many albums have you recorded to date now then? God, I hate admitting this because people put them down nearly by every two years. So if, you, if I admit it, I'm showing my age. <laughs> um, I, I don't count the compilations or the best ofs. So um, this is number 14. Wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. If I count the compilations and best ofs, you'd be in there with 17 <laughs> and 18, but anyway. And you're one of these artists as well, you can't just put you on a specific genre. You've, you've tried everything really throughout your career, haven't I you? It's not that I've tried it, I've just done it. I, I'm not a fan of labels. Um, yeah. I'm not a fan of being pigeonholed and put into a box. Um, I've never been, I've never, I've never liked that. Even as a kid, I didn't like that. It's music, I never go and deliberately pick that song because it's a different, that, that's not how it works with me. How it works is I hear a song or a writer presents it to me or I, I write, co-write a song or whatever I might do. But the song has to tell a story. It has to tell a great story. And you just have to like it. It's, yeah. you know, uh, if somebody said to me like, I'm not rock, I'm not pop, I'm not trad, I'm not country, you know, I'm just a singer who loves good music, Yeah, you know? So the new album, which is out now, is called uh, The Voice of Hope 2. The Voice of Hope 2. The first one was done in the Basilica Knock right. in um, 2004. That was a massive success. It was a it? huge success yeah. for us, thank God. I actually, I said it in an interview in, uh, on American television. I don't, think, I don't think they took it too well. But anyway, I, uh, they, they said to me, and that was, hugely, that was a huge surprise and a huge success. To which I said, yeah, I was the second apparition and that was a bigger shock than the first one. <laughs> 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 so I don't, think they got, I don't think they got the joke. But anyway, um, but yeah, so when we did the first one in Knock, that was filmed um, in front of an audience of 5,000. Right, yeah. So then when we came to doing the second one, I wanted to keep it in the West of Ireland. Yeah. Because I've, I've grown up in the West of Ireland and I am ingrained in the West of Ireland and it's ingrained in me. So I went on the hunt and I knew I had a few ideas where I wanted to do it. Um, and Galway Cathedral was one of them. And wow. when I seen the inside of Galway Cathedral and the dome and the, uh, the logistics really of it was mm. the main thing for me. But when I seen what the set, what a natural set can look like, yes, that's yeah. when I said, this is it, this is where we're doing it. So tell us about the songs on the album. How did you choose these? It took me a year to choose what went on it and to structure the show. So it was easy to kind of pick the, choose the, the older ones because I knew you couldn't come in and do an album of brand new material yeah especially a live album so 
we chose the old ones like From a Distance, like Contender, which was written by Jimmy McCarthy. And a lot of Irish writers were involved yeah. in it. Restless Spirit, who was written by my good friend John Hurley. And then to get the new material. And it kind of happened by default because I was working with an amazing artist by the name of Mark Vincent from Sydney in Australia. And I heard him singing a version of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah in Spanish. Right. And I loved it and it was done very classically. And I loved it. So I came back and I was toying with the idea of bringing Mark over to Ireland and I asked him what he'd do it. And he said, I'd love to. He wanted to get to visit Ireland. So he'd throw in a concert while he was there. So Mark arrived over and we worked together on this. So I came up with the idea of doing it in multilingual. So it was done. We sang Hallelujah in first verse was done in English by me. Mark sang the second one in Spanish and I did the third verse in Irish. Wow. And then we came back in in English together. So it was a it was a lovely way of doing it. Yeah. And then we did Climb Every Mountain together. And the one thing I've always wanted to do is kind of tip my finger to the other part of my job, which is as an actor. Um, and that's and when the one thing I love is when those two disciplines meet is when singing and acting meet, especially in a theatre show. So I needed to kind of, I wanted to do the one song I've always wanted to do from a theatre show was Bring Him Home. Yes. So I put that in. So that's kind of how the, there was reasons behind songs. Yeah. Um, you know, Christy Hennessy's Roll Back the Clouds. Um, and did you know Christy? I knew Christy very well. And uh, in 2007, it's 2007 or eight, eight actually, when Christy was diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. And I didn't real—I didn't know he was at this point. So he was also recording the, uh, the Two of Us album, mm -hmm. which was the duets album. And he asked me to do Jealous Heart with him. Yeah. And I went in and I recorded that duet with him um, about three and a half weeks before he passed away. Wow. So, and what I loved about Christy was he had that infectious smile. Yeah. And he could walk into a room full of people in a bad mood. And within five minutes, he could turn the room. Yeah, yeah. So as well as the album, you're going out on tour with this as well, I am, aren't you? I am. So I'm coming to Belfast on the 1st of February okay. to our Ulster Hall. Um, and I think it's the end of January we're in the uh, Millennium Forum. So uh, it's always, I love coming back here. I love, Belfast is a special one for me. Um, I remember my very first gig in Belfast, well, not, not today or yesterday, was in St. Anne's Hall <laughs> in West Belfast. Right, yeah. And there was about 20 people at it. Yeah. I think some woman turned up because she thought it was somebody else. <laughs> um, and she was given out for the whole way through the gig. Right. At the top of her voice. I'll always remember that. And uh, it, was, it was brilliant. And one of my best experiences ever was I uh, pulled in at a garage on the way to Derry one day. And I was paying for my diesel. And uh, this man comes up and he says, <laughs> it was really funny. He turns out to me and he says, did anyone ever tell you you're the image of Tommy <laughs> <laughs> So I kind of conceded, he said, yeah, 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 yeah. And he says, no, seriously, he says, you're very like him. And I said, um, I said, well, I actually am him. He said, no, he said, you're very like him. And I never said, you're the amateur. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent the next 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes trying to convince him I was me. And eventually I got into the car going, what the hell am I just doing? <laughs> anyway, so that's why I, I, what I love about uh, uh, up here is I love the honesty and I love, yeah. I love the, um, what you see is what you get. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's no, there's no frills on anything, yeah. and I love that. You know. Are you thinking about the next album already? Oh God, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm actually thinking. I'm, but I've been, I've been looking at. Uh, there's a script for uh, another show that came in that I've been looking at, and I just because I know when it comes to doing uh, acting in a show, it, th that takes a huge amount of work and discipline because you spend six, seven months actually learning the script, and you have to go into rehearsals and all that sort of stuff. So I'm looking at going back, maybe doing one of those for a while. Right, but yeah. uh, until then, I'm I'm just going to concentrate on this one, and you know. And then I've t I'm touring all of next year, so I'm not just in Ireland. I'm in the UK, the US, and then I head to Australia, which is always kind of it's almost a second home at this yeah. point. So I head to Australia in September, middle September, late September, and that brings us up to Christmas. So I keep saying that I'm going to take a little bit of time off yeah. and take a back seat now and again. That doesn't seem to happen in the last while, but. I'll get there. I wanted to talk to you as well about uh, your charity work because you're out in Rwanda, yeah. weren't you? That's my second or third trip to Africa, actually. I work with a charity called Bohar, which is really an agricultural-based charity. And how they work is, instead of, 
I think the principle, to explain the principle easily is, you know, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Give a man a fishing rod, he'll eat for the rest of the week, you know. But, um, so instead of donating money to the different things in, in Africa, what we do is we get farmers to donate cattle to us, like a female mm -hmm. heifer calf is donated to us, which then at the age of 18 months, two years is impregnated, and that's shipped to the likes of Rwanda, and go all of those different places and that feeds the family that provides an income it provides education that one cow is just it's the golden goose really yeah. and then there's a what they call is the passing on the gift which is so if that when that cow gives birth if it's an, if it's a female calf that's passed on to the next family that needs it right and so it continues if it's a bull then the family get to keep it and sell it um, and then the money is put towards buying another one or whatever it may be but it's about education it's about how to be I suppose self-sufficient in so many different ways and it you know it's the difference between you know they sell the milk from that cow and it's the difference between making five euros a week mm -hmm. uh, just working around the house and looking after this cow than making one euro a week in working in fields yeah. you know so it's it's just I suppose some relief to give it's given something back, I guess. Yeah. You know. And will you go back out to Africa again? I will. I'm going back out. What they're doing is um, they've got the flying ark, as they call it. So the big um, uh, cargo plane comes into Shannon Airport mm -hmm. and it's loaded with all the animals. And then it flies direct to Kigali from Shannon into Rwanda. And that's a 15 hour flight. So uh, they've asked me, will I go on the the flying arc and I didn't have to ask me twice I'm like <laughs> absolutely I just want the experience yes, of it yeah. so Tina has come my wife is coming with me and um, she was like well what kind of a flight will it be and I said okay let me put it this way you have to bring a sleeping bag <laughs> <laughs> for the plane yeah but just make sure you have two bottles of wine with you <laughs> <laughs> and a packed lunch you'd be grand you'd be sleeping on a bale of straw <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> I think it'd be brilliant. I think it'd be great experience. Brilliant. You know, you might want to come home on it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the chance you take, you know? Brilliant. Yeah. Tommy, you're going to do one more from the album. What are you going to do this time? I'm going to do, seeing as it's coming up to Christmas, I'm going to do a song that I, I learned a long time ago. I did it on a Christmas album, actually. And I got it from a singer called Jerry Welch. So it's a story that's set in No Man's Land in um, 1915, when Germany, the true story of when Germany had one day of truce, peace with the Allies which was Christmas Day, and they shared everything on that day, whatever meagre rations, whatever, whatever they had to offer, they shared it. And the next day they returned to, I suppose really what became known as one of the most senseless and bloodiest wars in history. Mm -hmm. um, and it just gives you a great, the song, I, what I love about the song is it gives you a great, um, a great sense of the story. It gives you a sense of the horror that those soldiers went through. Some of them were as young as 15, in that war, they'd lied on draft papers to fight in a war they had no idea what they were fighting for. So I, that's what I just love that, again, I go back to a story and a song, and that's, this, this is one of them. So this is Christmas 1915. Lovely, well Tommy, the album is out now, Voice of Hope 2. Good luck with that. Thank and, you very uh, much. we look forward to seeing you back in Belfast in February. Absolutely, I'll, I'll sort out tickets, hopefully you can come down and see the show. I hope, yes, hope so. Ta Tommy, thank you so all. much. Thanks thank a million, thank, thank you. you. Nineteen fifteen on Christmas Day On the western front the guns all died away And sitting in the mud on bags of sand We heard a German sing from no man's land he had a tenor voice, so pure and true. The words were strange, but every note we soaring o'er the living, dead and dying. The Germans sang a piece from no man. They left their trenches 
front line Their singer was a lad of 21 We begged another song before the dawn And sitting in the mud and blood and peace He sang again the song all on Silent night, no cannons roar. A king of peace is born forevermore. All's calm, all's bright, all brothers hand in hand. In nineteen fifteen. In no man's land In the morning all the guns boomed in the rain And we killed them and they killed us again with bayonet, bomb and bullet, gas and flame. And neither we nor they at all to blame. There was heavy fighting right throughout the day. For one night's peace, we bloodily did pay. At night they charged. We fought them hand to hand And I killed the boy that sang In no man's land Silent night No cannons roll A king of peace is born forever All's calm, all's bright, all brothers hand in hand. And that young soldier sings, and the song of peace still rings, though the captains and all the kings build no man's land. Deep in 